سبيل الدموع سبيل مريح تنهدى يا صاحي كي تستريح وبث الدعاء الخفي الصريح يسعك الفضاء الرحيب الفسيح سبيل الدموع السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته we're here for uh, part two of applications of traditional Islamic law, which is Hanafi fiqh in the West. The series is all about Muslims in non-Muslim lands, and we're particularly trying to focus on the legal applications of that, and that's exactly the chapter that we've reached. This is the second of two parts. Uh, first part is already on our channel, and then this will lead us into the conclusion, which will sum up the full 14 episodes of this series inshallah and bring together the key points that we're trying to uh, uh, bring to your attention uh, and uh, conclude with so let's uh, let's go straight into it we had in the last part if you can uh, recall or quite easily press the button and watch it again if you so wish we discussed uh, a few areas in which we were applying this traditional Islamic law this model and where we'd applied it was in, uh, in, em in employment and we looked at the use of uh, handling alcohol and we looked at for example um, working in a supermarket of sorts uh, dealing with interest there, that was from a sort of banking perspective and we looked at employment and services generally we then went on to meat and meat products and, and how that's uh, applied in terms of slot oh, sorry we didn't touch upon that but that you'll find in the chapter but we did touch upon additives and how uh, inqilab al-ayn is something we would also explore and how it would be applied we now reach the medicines and medical interventions because there's many advances which are made within the medical sciences things which we can do now that we could never dream of doing if whatever there was a, a, a excessive blood loss due to some kind of incident then that person was was going to die but now with the blood transfusion even if there is a significant level of blood loss, as long as he gets to a hospital quick enough, the individual can quite easily receive blood from a blood bank and he's, uh, he can ev eventually make a full recovery. So that's something which, uh, which didn't exist. But we're also seeing that um, medical products, items in there, for example, the use of alcohol in cough medicine, say, and things of that nature, we reach that point as well. So what do we do in these sorts of surroundings or in these kind of uh, situations? What well, we find uh, this discussion uh, being uh, discussed by Ibn Abidin when he looks at the use of illegal materials for medicinal purposes. And he says it is permissible if it is known that there's a cure in them and no other medicine is known or available. And uh, in Khaniya, which is the, the paper he cited, the book he cites, he says, that when we look at the meaning of the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu in which he said, uh, which is narrated by Imam Bukhari, in which he said, indeed, Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala did not place cures in that which he has made illegal for you. Therefore, in understanding that is, if there's a cure there, then this can be understood in two ways. For some fuqaha, they see this that, well, if something is impure, then there can't be a cure in there. So they look at it from that perspective. Others look at it from the perspective of the cure, that if there's a cure in there, then it can't be it can't be considered as impure so depending on each uh, faqih's perspective one can reach a particular decision so we see here again further uh, he now references uh, tahdib in which he says it's permissible for a sick person to drink urine uh, or blood or even consume carrion for medicinal purposes when a muslim doctor informs him that there's cure in it and he does not find any other cure uh, which is available to him why the why the specification of a muslim doctor because a muslim doctor would understand the gravity of instructing an individual to consume something in which we find text making it quite clear that that item is impure and the permissibility is well thought of beforehand uh, as in the Muslim doctor is, is well aware of the ramifications of permitting something which is uh, categorically and explicitly considered as impure or considered as impermissible for its utilization. So that's a point that's being made there in, uh, as when he cites Tahdib. Uh, he also cites Tata uh, al in which he says that there's nothing wrong in drinking that which intoxicates the mind so the uh, gangrenous sore or the like can be removed. 
now nowadays obviously uh, the the hospitals will will uh, will attach some kind of a uh, an aesthetic to put the individual to sleep so the operation can be carried out with 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 no pain because if a person's in a awake state and you're going to cut him open or remove a part of the body due to uh, cancer or something like that and that person is going to feel exceptional pain and that pain could that shock as well uh, could, uh, could could cause more uh, could cause more problems so what happens instead is that the person is, is put to sleep deep sleep so the operation can be carried out with minimal pain well again going back to the uh, times in which these books were written and even previous to that there was no uh, sort of anesthetic of that nature so what would happen is that uh, consuming alcohol would obviously intoxicate the mind and allow the sort of receivers in the brain not to be able to register the pain that this person was feeling as this gangrenous saw was being removed by a, by a knife of some sort so you can see there that even in these sort of dire situations whereby you know alcohol is being made permissible uh, to to drink and something which is considered as a rich or nudges and, and and something which is highly uh, considered as impermissible is is being permitted in these rare circumstances so again we can see the fluidness and the flexibility of the sharia taking into consideration the person's circumstances in order to apply certain types of uh, fiqh which wouldn't have been applied in what we would consider as normal circumstances i did touch upon the uh, blood transfusion as well and you find within my text that i mentioned this blood transfusion and we have this uh, argument that uh, human body parts should be prohibited to be utilized uh, why because of the dignity and honor that's given to the body ir irrespective of whether the individual is alive or dead However, this is a more general illa, and we can see that when we see the use of blood in particular, that the blood is being used very much so in a similar way. I appreciate someone would argue that human milk is actually being made, created to provide for uh, nourishment for the young. A book, let's look at it in a more general sense, it is a part of human. The uh, milk, the, the human milk is, 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 part of a, is a product of the human. So that shows it can be used and utilized. Now, obviously, we see that human blood can also be used, and it's something that we can generate. So, like the way uh, milk uh, that's removed from the mother, she can then generate further milk. Similarly, if a person was to donate blood, then as long as they're donate, not donating excessive large amounts of blood, if they were to donate a small amount of blood, then the body would eventually regenerate that blood. And, I, and it's mentioned as well that blood is constantly being regenerated anyway. So... This shows that if we took this type of khayas and, that's, and apply it upon the human milk, that the, bl the blood can be used. Now the other question which comes into it is what about organ transplantation? Now organ transplantation, there's much debate about this as to whether it's permissible or not. And sometimes a demarcation is made, a, a difference is made between receiving organs and giving organs. And, and many people find that somewhat confusing as to why can one receive an organ but not give an organ. And the reason being is that receiving an organ is, is a, you know, no, that doesn't mean that everybody accepts even the receipt of an organ. But those fuqaha who accept the receiving an, of an organ, their argument for not giving an organ is that at uh, what time do you, est do you determine death? Uh, you know, is it brain death? Is it when the, the, there's no brain activity? Um, at what, you know, where, where are you going to draw that line? You know, when the, when the individual stops breathing, when the individual stops being active on his own. So do you call somebody who's being sort of kept alive by uh, uh, machinery as still being alive? Uh, is his soul still attached? Has his soul left? You know, it's very difficult because according to Islam, the definition of a person dying is when his soul leaves his body. Now, it's very difficult to associate that with some physical attribute or some number or some means of measuring that. It's, it's, you know, there's no clear cut way of doing that and also uh, the human has to be harvested or his, uh, his body has to be then utilized the organs have to be removed quite quickly after death because in order to maintain them and utilize them again so at what point do you draw that line and this is where the cloudy area this is where the gray area comes because you could argue you could be argued that it's the actual cutting out of the organs which kill the person and the person had not died and, you know we have these many uh, anecdotal tales and, and also evidence from medical journals that people have you know had near-death experiences or you know come back to life after death when in reality they hadn't died 
um, because the measure that was used to determine death proved inaccurate in that particular instance. So because there's this gray area, scholars are somewhat hesitant to permit organ uh, donation, and whereas they can permit uh, the receipt of organs. So that's where the sort of, you know, kind of superficial hypocrisy comes, uh, is, is leveled against these scholars that, you know, and maybe even leveled against Muslims generally that, you know, they're, in, they're happy to receive organs but not so happy to donate organs and, you know, there should be some push in that direction as well. So that, that's the area. Now, if we could kind of find some sort of scientific way that could measure the exact time the soul has left their body, then that opens a, a debate in a whole new uh, context in a whole new area. Uh, and that's really the backdrop of, of the text that I've uh, written here as well. Uh, we can look at immuni immunization. Uh, some will argue that immunization is the intentional addition of a pathogen or the intentional addition of something, uh, even though it's been altered or diluted before administration. And in a way, what's happening here is you're making yourself ill intentionally. And uh, you should leave that to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That if you're going to become ill, then, you know, so be it. If you're going to get measles, a rubella, then you should wait until you get the illness because there's no preventative approaches that we should take. We wait for the illness. When the illness takes part, then we go get medicine. And polio and MMR and things of that nature are vaccines which are being used prior. Now, the vaccine for whooping cough, say, that's being used, given to children prior to them actually... Uh, receive or, or, or becoming ill with those particular illnesses however there is a justification for that and that is the sort of uh, lesser harm uh, is 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 uh, uh, accepted in order to remove a greater harm so the lesser harm in these circumstances is obviously to uh, inject either a weak weakened or attenuated pathogen or something which is uh, uh, extracting the part of the pathogen which brings about the immune response from those particular um, illnesses and giving that to the child in particular so that they build up this resistance and this is referred to as herd immunity in the, set, in, in the argument that if a large number of individuals were immunized then that would have an impact that even if the other small percentage weren't that it would eventually eliminate that particular illness so we can see the Sharia with its legal maxims can be used in order to immunize a person and as a result protect themselves for a greater harm at a later date. So again you can see within the medicinal world new changes, things which haven't happened until the last century or so and uh, yet a 1400 year old Sharia is still adept, it's still flexible, it's still robust enough to be able to deal with those changes and those requirements and demands from modern life. And it's not found wanting. Inheritance is, a, is another area in which a person, obviously, if a person converts to Islam and their family members continue to be non-Muslim, then A, they can't inherit from their non-Muslim family members and B, their non-Muslim family members can't inherit from them. I appreciate that if the, uh, if the no, uh, no, no will existed, then the, the, the English law would, would, would come into operation and would foresee it through. But if there was a will, then the will would have to be honoured and respected. Uh, and the individual who made the will, it would be followed through according to him. So, but, you know, so what happens? Does that mean that there's no link between the two? Well, you know, we've seen, for example, within the text that uh, a bequest can be made, you know, uh, in, 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 to a Muslim. Because he can't inherit anyway, then this bequest can be made so that they can inherit from them. Uh, and other means can be made as well uh, in order to transfer the wealth between the Muslim and the non-Muslim. Again, that's detailed within the text. Quickly moving on, and I'm, I'm moving through this at some pace because, again, as I explained in the part which, which preceded this part, is we're just, these are, this is just to give an overview, really, of the flexibility and robustness of the tr application of this traditional interpretation of Islam through the various areas of human activity and human uh, involvement and to, to show that it's not found wanting in any of these cases. It's quite comfortably dealing with, with the situations which are being put to it. The next one is uh, financial transactions and fin financial transactions, you know, non-contact sales, we're you know, talking about nowadays, you know, we buy a lot of things off the internet, 
and we buy a lot of things now through apps and things of that nature, which uh, was a, was a thing unheard. Uh, in you know even 30, 40 years ago, maybe even only 20 years ago, uh, it's a new thing which is coming about, and it's having a massive impact on human behavior, human activity. But we see within the majella uh, that uh, the thing to be sold must exist. So as long as the item exists, it's fine. Uh, it must be that the delivery of the thing be possible. The necessary thing being sold should be mal mutaqawwim. Um, what does mal mutaqawwim mean? Meaning that the first is that the law, the sharia, considers it to be legally sound to utilize. And the second means that it's acquired property, something that people do acquire. So fish in the sea is not mal mutaqawwim. Why? Because the fish are not in the possession of the individual, which would be different if the fish had been caught and kept in a small tank or something or a small uh, uh, area of water because then it would be easy to use a net or something and, and take the fish out that they're just being kept alive uh, before a purchase is made if at all they're being sold as fresh fish otherwise the fish uh, once they've been removed from the sea they could be kept obviously then they are quite clearly without any shadow doubt man uh, that the it's also necessary that the buyer should know the thing sold so there should be an accurate description or a good quality picture so whenever we're making purchases online we'll see a detailed explanation of the product we'll also see images of the product uh, and if it's going to be slightly different either in, in color or, or whatever then they'll say that you may not get it in this particular color the color might not be what you're seeing on that image so it does clarify that uh, so the person's well aware and the thing sold is identified through a description of its qualities and state which will distinguish it from other things well nowadays as i said if you go onto amazon ebay or any place like that you'll see a full detailed explanation you're now even seeing uh, purchases comments buyers comments those who bought it they explain it even in more so detail you'll see images of it even nowadays sometimes there's very short video is on it as well where you can actually see the item moving around or you can sort of take the mouse and go over it and and uh, magnify parts of it so you can see the material you can see the the, the the sort of cut of the cloth the type of uh, zips or whatever fasteners that's been used so it's as though you are looking at the item in front of your very face so it's uh, so you can see that non-contact sales of that nature even though i said this was unheard of even 20 30 years ago the sharia still has within it the flexibility and robustness to be able to deal with that currency trading is, is another uh, you know, we've now shifted from gold and silver uh, as we were, as we used to use in the in the old days, and we've now shifted to currency papers, which uh, are in a, in essence uh, a currency itself now, because they don't actually stand in place of the gold and silver. Because you know, I willingly uh, uh, intend to pay the bearer of this note or words to that effect that we find on our ten pound notes and twenty pound notes and five pound notes we don't actually expect to walk into a bank and say right there you go here's a five pound I want five pounds worth of gold you won't get that because the currency itself is now the, the uh, paper currency in itself has become a type of currency so it's uh, it's used uh, and so we start seeing nowadays that if we're going to exchange pound sterling for pound sterling then it must be like for like hand to hand um, we can't say, well, you know, it's it's diff, it's uh, it's uh, it's not gold, it's not silver, it's not one of the six things that I mentioned, which is wheat, barley, dates, salt, gold, and silver, which is mentioned in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu a mashur hadith. So, it, you know, some will argue, well, hold on, gold, it's not gold and it's not silver, but as we've said now, it's a currency in itself, and the gold and silver were currencies. That's what was used to purchase items. It was the thaman. It was a price that was paid for the mabi, the product. But what about now where we see people sort of, you know, sort of straining over a laptop and spending hours looking at graphs and spending hours looking at figures as they see, uh, as they look at currency exchange. So maybe exchanging the, the pound for a euro or, or ex exchanging the euro for a South African rand or exchanging a South African rand for an American dollar or exchanging an American dollar for a uh, uh, Saudi Arabian real. Or exchanging that for a Pakistani rupee. So, I mean, what if somebody is actually exchanging currencies? What is that permissible? Well, in that case, it's it is permissible because as long as there's the majlis is taking place, then the uh, the transfer, the exchange is is fine. And this is what we talk about in 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 the uh, uh, this particular section. Okay. Um, so if so, where do we go to? So based on currency of the same country with an increase from one of the parties, a condition of the they consider riba, which is already touched upon. So exchanging one 
uh, sterling for two sterling is impermissible. Okay. However, it's not necessary in the case with exchange of gold for gold that both parties take possession of the currency they have exchanged in the same majlis. The reason is that Muslim jurist paper currency is not treated like gold and silver, but rather as a legal tender and as such a medium of exchange, and therefore you can actually carry that out. One part, as long as one party takes possession during the transaction before separating, uh, as because debts aren't permitted on both sides. Okay, but that's exchanging a life for life. But what about exchanging currencies of different countries? This is legal even with an excess on one side. So exchanging one British pound. Uh, or sterling pound for two euros. This is because the jinns of both currencies is different. And when you're exchanging items of varied nature, it is not illegal or impermissible to have excess on one side. And that's what we're referring to here. So it is permitted then to trade in currencies of different countries and to make a profit from such a trade. However, it is necessary for one of the parties to take possession of the amount at the time of the transaction because uh, two parties uh, leaving if they are separating uh, with debt on both sides is impermissible okay so this is what it's referring to and that again shows that it's a relatively new area of finance you know dealing in currency was not something that used to happen it's now happening with all the you know penny shares and everything else which goes on online nowadays everybody's making a, you know a, a quick book or two with this uh, various transactions so here again we can see some um, flexibility and permissibility in that as well. Finally, before we bring this particular chapter to uh, a, a close, is referring more on to the uh, sort of social side of things, political side of things. The concept of citizenship. And we can see the concept of citi citizenship quite clearly that we're now seeing that people are choosing to live in a secular state um, here we are in Britain, for example, it's a secular state. Yes, it might have its uh, foundations within Christianity, but it's now a secular, democratic, liberal state. It allows Muslims and non-Muslims to be involved in all aspects of its identity. It doesn't, uh, doesn't sort of forbid uh, Muslims to do certain things which non-Muslims can and can't do. You could, you know, we've got a, a, this currently as I speak, the Lord Mayor of London is a Muslim so it permits that type of behavior it allows individuals to achieve anything uh, it does not stop a person yes there might be areas where it's not perfect absolutely we we take that on face value uh, that there are areas where still there can be um, prejudice there can be limits to where a person can achieve and what they can't achieve uh, based upon their agenda based upon their religion and um, so there doesn't seem to be any prohibition of this type of activity or behavior either. And this was not something which was new. We saw that as well during the discussions about uh, how the uh, state, the, the, the apparatus of the state separated itself from the scholarship, from the fuqaha. The two went their own ways very early on in Islamic history. In fact, very much so after the khulafa the four khulafa, we saw this split occurring where in, you know, one individual no longer had the reins of both the worldly power and the power of the hereafter. Uh, the two separated and we saw that there was a kind of a, um, an agreed sort of co uh, partnership between the two. They both needed each other in order to survive and, and, and that's how they worked. And we saw that sort of taking on board. We now look at, and there's much work that's sort of, I'm still working in this area, and uh, you'll see, for example, on our uh, Telegram channel, much of the work that I'm sort of uh, posting on there. But you'll also find uh, some work I'm doing, a translation of Monana Thamiruddin Saab's uh, book uh, on this particular area, uh, which I've called a, a translation of that I'm working on, which is Muslims and Non-Muslim Relations. That's hopefully uh, due out somewhere along the, along the time that this recording will be made available. And similarly, I've just received uh, Monana Khalid Saifullah's uh, uh, work as well on this very same topic. So there is work now finally in this area, which is good to see as when uh, this work was getting done, this research was getting done, which was back in sort of 2008, 9 and 10, uh, and even probably prior to that, yeah, maybe even 2007. So we were talking about 10 years ago, hardly anybody was sort of touching this topic, but alhamdulillah over the 10 year period, it seems to be now slow, but uh, a build up of uh, activity in this area where we're now looking at this new phenomenon of Muslims living in sort of liberal democratic societies where the state is not a religious state 
where a person's identity is very much his citizenship identity rather than his religious identity and that's what we're trying to see we've discussed as well and you'd have seen in many of my uh, other videos about the fact of assimilation is not what we're referring to here it's this freedom to as long as the uh, every any uh, religion a person who follows a religion is not is abide is rather abiding by the state laws not breaking any state laws then the individual is allowed the flexibility to worship in whichever way they choose again without if they're not sort of overstepping the mark of breaking any state laws and behaving in a in a sensible way and in fact we find that within these uh, secular societies within these liberal democratic societies that the muslims have been able to develop far more and be able to um, uh, express themselves than they have been even in their own sort of you know homelands and their own sort of muslim majority states where the state uh, is sort of acting in a way which has never been what the state is that you know there's more dictatorships the flexibility to act upon your own interpretation um, of Islam and being able to practice your religion freely and for minorities like Christians and Jews to be able to also practice their religion uh, that seems to have changed that tide has changed I'm not going to go into the reasons for that uh, you know whether it was um, the, you know, kind of either the conspiracy theories or uh, factual statements and foreign policies of Western governments and things of that nature we leave that for another time but the point is that's what's uh, that's what's developing so we can see that Muslims uh, do come together under this broad umbrella of the Ummah. Clearly they do. Uh, they have religious identity which brings them all together, clumps them all together. And for that reason there needs to be some kind of organization, very similar, very akin to the Catholic Church, where they, you know, there is some body, call it whatever you like, an Islamic legal council, some kind of entity which uh, tends to the religious needs of the community. It doesn't need to meet for its political needs because that really stopped, you know, very early on after the Khulafa Rashidin. It, it no longer existed. Uh, it, it became, a, it, it reached an end after that point. There was no sort of way forward. And it's, uh, it's on that particular point that we'd like, you know, the, the, the key point there is that with this kind of legal counsel, with this structure in place, this will ensure this will ensure that these individuals' religious needs are being met. And that's, as I said, after the Khulafa, this is what was really going on, is the schools as they were developing were meeting these religious needs, whereas these individuals could find themselves in various sultanate, in various areas uh, across the Muslim world. We see a similar thing now. Now, it might be that these need to be more localized and more regional, which is what we start to see is more localized and regional bodies of, of ulama that are tending to the needs of say British Muslims or European Muslims or or you know American Muslims so they're, they're, they're more uh, but the, what, what happens is this doesn't allow the kind of ummah to sort of come together and have more clout uh, and be able to deal with issues which are more of a global nature uh, you know global, global situations be able to react to those global situations like the Catholic Church can so there needs to be some kind of thought along these lines in order to be able to a show the permissibility of the individuals as working within this uh, uh, non-muslim environment which we've seen throughout history but also be able to um, assist in their um, identity as muslims finally the last point is participating in elections some will argue oh this, this is you know impermissible this is not right you know that's nonsense here what we're talking about is um, Muslims being able to give their view about who should be in charge of their secular needs. Now again, let's remember, we're living in a society which is not religiously based, a country which is not religiously based, even though its foundations may be within Christianity, it's not religiously based. It's a liberal society, it's a secular society, and it's a democratic society, and it tends to its, the needs of its citizens, all of them, Muslim and non-Muslim. Now, how do you decide who's going to kind of, you know, rule over us or control us or, de you know, uh, decide where what this country does, both uh, in terms within the UK and outside of the UK? Well, we need some government, we need some structure in place, and that's where political parties come in. And by this individual expressing their desire for a particular political party, he's not, ju he's not deciding against Allah. This is a very simplistic, uh, literal understanding. What he's looking at is this individual is going to look after my 
social needs, he's going to look after my citizenship needs, not look after my religious needs. Even if you voted a, a, a Muslim, uh, we have now a Muslim Lord Mayor in uh, London, he's not a, a mufti or something, he's not a scholar or something, he's not suddenly going to start bringing Islamic Sharia in London uh, because that's not his role, he's not, he's not a scholar. His role is as an individual who's tending to the citizenship needs of all his community, irrespective of who they are, whether they profess a religion or not. That's his role. Yes, he has his own religious practices. That's a different thing altogether. And that's for him to decide as each individual decides what their religious practices are, what they feel comfortable with, what they don't feel comfortable with. Because as Muslims, we make those decisions and we will be judged by those decisions. And that's our decisions to make. But when it comes to looking after the community, then he's looking at, he's, he's looking at it from a citizenship perspective of tending to the needs of all his community. So putting somebody in place by voting them in, then that does, then the, again we find within the traditional school that it allows that uh, permissibility to partake in those kind of activities. That brings me to the end of part two of this discussion that we've had on uh, Muslims in non-Muslim lands. And it leaves now just to move on to the conclusion. The conclusion inshallah in our next episode will bring together all our discussions in the 14 episodes in total and also summarize where we are and uh, hopefully it will bring an end to this series of muslims in non-muslim lands wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillah rabbil alameen wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulil anbiya wa salamu salim amma ba'da assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh سبيل مريح تنهدى يا صاحي كي تستريح وبث الدعاء الخفي الصريح